All right, we're live. We're going to let it breathe. Just a couple seconds here. Welcome in, everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast presented, as always, by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, my partner in crime. You know him. You love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, interesting that Melvin Gordon, if the Denver Broncos indeed in the NFL are unable to play in front of fans this fall because of the word that shall go unmentioned on this podcast forevermore, at least for Melvin Gordon, it won't be anything new. He's been used to not playing in front of home crowd fans for a long, long time. Yeah, you know, and uh, in SoFi Stadium, the new stadium they're building out there in Los Angeles, it's not going to really house like the big house in Michigan. It's not going to be some 100,000 capacity stadium. And he's used to, like he said, playing in front of diminished audiences. So if there's limited capacity this year, it's nothing new for Melvin Gordon. But he'll see in Denver, that's where real fans come out, Chad. It's not like in Los Angeles where fans are nary fairy. They're not really committed to any one team among the four major sports. But in Denver, it's a football town, it's a football city, it's a football state, and he will see that starting in week one. For those of you who missed it, he was on a chat with a fellow former Wisconsin Badger, um, Marcus Cromartie. Here's what he said really quick. This is this is just a – I think it's like a 30-second clip. Uh, it's maybe a little bit longer, but it's worth a watch. Check it out, you guys. Wait to play at the new Raider Stadium, the new L.A. Stadium. How would it feel if you go into these games and there's no fans in the stadium? I know there's been a lot of talk about there being fanless games. Like, could you imagine playing in a football game with no fans or there being crowd noise pumped into the into the stadium? Bro, we didn't have fans anyway. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh man, Charger fans. We didn't have many Charger fans at the game. I'm just being honest. We didn't have many Charger fans at the game, you know. Much loyalty, love, but we ain't had many, so I'm not missing anything. So I ain't really, I ain't oh, really man. So much. It was crazy because uh, Pounce from the Steelers said that to his brother on, on Instagram, uh, on his little story, and I was like, bro, he's not lying. Like, <laughs> guys can't wait to play at the new. All right, all right, stadium. all right. Enough. It's true, though. I mean, how I can think back to a time when it was Qualcomm Stadium. The height of the Ladanian Tomlinson, Philip Rivers, Antonio Gates, Vincent Jackson era, when the Chargers were a double-digit win team for a good four or five-year stretch, got to the AFC title game that one year, went 14-2 and two that year. There was a time when Qualcomm Stadium actually could put some butts in the seats, Zach, but as Gordon says, it's been a minute, and ever since they moved to L.A. especially, their attendance just went off a cliff. He's well acquainted with Broncos fans because they always packed the the former Charger Stadium anyway for road games. It was always a Denver populace in San Diego or Los Angeles, wherever they played. And that's a credit to Broncos fans for traveling well, and it's a discredit to Chargers fans for not showing up to their own uh, to, you know their own games. So Melvin Gordon should be well acquainted with the orange and blue because they always come out no matter what city you're in, Chad. Like we always say, it's a true state of being, even on the field and off the field. Amen. Gang, tonight is our favorite podcast of the week. It is the Mile High Mailbag. We are your football priests. Each and every week, we're here to offer you the absolution and the answers to your burning Broncos questions. And we look forward to getting to whatever's on your mind here in the chat stream here shortly in the Super Chats as well. But first, there was one topic of business I wanted, well, topic I wanted to get to about Garrett Bowles, Pro Football Focus. I don't want to bog down the podcast on Garrett Bowles per se, but it did bring up something that was an interesting topic to me, which I'll get to in just one second. Really quick, guys, fast, quick matters of business. Make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. That's how you keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time. Also, while you're at it, make sure you follow at Mile High Huddle. If you're in a position, check out the merch store, HuddleUpPod.com. Get your swag on. Grab a hat like this. Get a football priest or a Mile High Huddle t-shirt or a state of being hoodie, mugs, face masks. And there's a little something for for everybody. Female tees as well. It's not just for dudes. A little something for everybody. If you're in a position to check that out, it's a great way to support what we're doing here at MHH. And if not, it's all good. We're just glad that you're here with us. We'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe, especially if you're watching this on YouTube. Don't forget to like this video regardless of where you're watching this live and share it out if you really like what we're doing here. All right, Zach. Before we get to the chat stream, I wanted to get your take on 
something that PFF said. Now, it's no secret <clears throat> that PFF has kind of been, I don't know, the the contrarian when it comes to Garrett Bowles tropes, right? Especially since week nine of last season. And it's true that he did play better down the stretch, but I can't remember the exact metric. I think they had him either as the highest or second highest graded pass blocking left tackle in the league from like week nine on last season. And there, there have been several articles this off season in which they've, you know, they've praised Garrett Bowles and they had another one in a sense here Uh, just today, or it might've came out yesterday Nick Kendall had the article for us at milehighhuddle.com, but they basically went through all 32 teams and said, here's who we, based on, you know, um, our grading system and all that, here's each team's most underrated player. Garrett Bowles got the selection for PFF. Now, I don't necessarily, we, I can read their blurb if you want to, but what more, I want to get your thoughts on it, but what more interests me, Zach, is, Who else or who might have been a more appropriate selection as the most underrated Bronco? Because Bowles, I can understand an argument for it. I'm not going to pretend that there's no merit there or he's like the worst player in the world because he's not. He's a bonehead sometimes, but he's not the worst player in the world. The most underrated on the roster, that I'm not so sure. Who would be your pick? It wouldn't be Garrett Bowles. I, I mean, I can understand not calling him a bust because he's quite not there yet. He's kind of teetering on that line, but underrated Not in the least, Chad. I would go with someone like Kareem Jackson. It's hard when you discount the young players because there's so many young players on the Broncos roster. You you can't really say A.J. Johnson. You can't say Dalton Reisner. You can't say Phillip Lindsay. They're not underrated yet because they're not really proven yet as bona fide NFL players. So Kareem Jackson, he's kind of a borderline household name. He's a good player, but not a lot of fans know how good he can be or how he was last year in this defense. I'm going K-Jack, Chad. Okay, Jack is, a, is an excellent choice. We, we kind of clown on Todd Davis sometimes because of his lack of coverage skills and the twitchiness, but he is underrated as a, as a run-stuffing linebacker in the league. You know, if he would have been in the NFL even 15 years ago, he would have been a top-five linebacker just because he's such a good run-stuffer, does not miss tackles, et cetera. I think there could be an argument for Davis. I think there could even be a fair argument for Justin Simmons because even though he was named second-team All-Pro by the Associated Press last year, let us not forget, he was snubbed for the Pro Bowl. Right. So it's not a question of, is he underrated? He, absolutely, Justin Simmons was underrated by the NFL last year. So on that side of the ball, offensively, I'm more inclined to agree with you in terms of who's really proven enough yet to be on the radar. I mean, who? Graham Glasgow? He just got paid a big fat contract. Right. How can you really say he's underrated? Who's the next best – the next – uh accomplished veteran i mean it's Cortland sutton and philip Lindsay who came in in 2018 they're not quite in the league long enough so i'm with you on that but i think on the defensive side of the ball there are some solid options garrett bowles to me i can understand the argument but he wouldn't be the first choice i mean my first inclination i saw a comment say aj johnson that was my first thought chat was to say him but he's he had one good season but he's really not proven enough to be considered underrated or overrated or anything in between that I would maybe say Philip Lindsay because the Broncos clearly disrespected him this offseason, bringing in Melvin Gordon for the price they paid for him. They obviously don't see much value in having a two-time 1,000-yard running back, a former Pro Bowler. I think on the Broncos, he is underrated, Philip Lindsay, but as a whole, outwardly to the rest of the fan bases around the NFL, I don't think Lindsay's that underrated. Amen. All right, guys. Let's see what's on your mind. Shout out to each and every one of you who have been hanging out in the room Duke, George, what's going on? Uh, let's see, Toy Mafia, Bronco Batman, been hanging out. If I didn't name you, I don't think we don't love you. We appreciate each and every one of you for being yeah. with us here tonight. Let's see what is on the minds of our awesome listeners. And it just did a jump, so let me just scroll up. All right, bear with me. Well, that's true. It was Garrett Bowles' birthday yesterday. So maybe we picked the wrong day to uh, – should, should we hold a party for him, Chad? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, all right. We let me see. I want to make. I know Bronx Legend jumped in, but I don't. Hold on. Bear with me one second, you guys. I got to see. Uh, Buana. I don't know if you can grab the next one, and I'll pull it up off of YouTube, and uh, we'll get this party started here. Oscar jumping in early with a five dollar super. Really Thank appreciate you, that. 
He says, I'm optimistic that Drew Locke will do well, but let's say he doesn't progress in 2020. Would you draft another quarterback or go hard after Aaron Rodgers? Loving MHH. Zach, your answer first, and then I'll piggyback after that. I'm going to jump on YouTube real quick. Neither. You give Drew Locke another year. He's a young quarterback in his first starting season. You need at least three years to judge any player, but especially raw quarterbacks. I'm not panicking if Locke has a down season. I'm not chasing another retread. I'm not giving all my money to Aaron Rodgers, first, second round draft picks, all that capital. I am rolling with Drew Locke, good or bad, in 2021. If he has another down season next year, Chad, two, two in a row, then... I consider drafting a quarterback in 2022, but not any time until then. You have to give him at least two full seasons, meaning last year and this year, to show what he has. I am inclined to agree with you. I would only add one caveat to that, and that is magnitude or degrees. You know, there there would have to there would be a little bit of nuance. Like if he just completely sucked it up and fell flat on his face, which nobody sees happening, right? But he would really have to suck it up to like epic proportions that just screamed and shouted, everyone was wrong, this dude is a bust. Like it would have to be telegraphed in no ifs, ands, or buts. And I just don't see that happening. I'm Paxton, inclined to agree with, with you on that, Zach. That Paxton got three years. Why wouldn't did. Drew Luck? Right. Well, let's see, 16, 17, cut on the doorstep of 2018. So we got two seasons, three training camps, cut. It's enough and, for a first round. Yeah. There, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I mean, if he was really fair to middling, I could see the Broncos bringing in a veteran, but not a veteran who would be a day one replacement for luck, but someone who could come in and be a little bit of a push yeah. for luck, kind of challenge him a little bit. Yeah. Not an Aaron Rodgers, I don't think. Like a Ryan Fitzpatrick, a, a borderline starter who you can win with, but he's not your preference as a long-term quarterback. I agree with that. If he falls on his face this year, then next year, 2021, I'm bringing in a better backup than Jeff Driscoll, but I'm still giving the job to Drew Locke. I'm just making it, it – it's not going to be his job off the bat completely. He's going to have to work for it, but he will be the starting quarterback this season and next season, regardless of what happens. And you can't rule anything out, but Oscar, I, I really don't see Drew Locke – having a bad season this year. He's going to have some inconsistencies. There will be ups, there will be downs, but he's going to I believe he'll he'll have a lot more ups than than downs. Bronx legend jumped in early with a $10 super. Thank you, Bronx. Appreciate you, my friend, and we're sorry that the stream jumped you. We couldn't actually show your your chat card, but this is the next best thing and we appreciate it. He says, "Garrett Bowles played better with Drew Lock in the game. Just hope that the black or the backlash, excuse me, he's gotten lights a fire under him talking about Bowles. He's still young." with much more to grow. Um, let me make sure that didn't cut him off with much more to grow. So, I mean, he is young in terms of NFL experience, but he's actually a very old right. fourth year player. So he doesn't have a lot of time to, I mean, all of his time that he could have wasted, that water is now under the bridge right. and he, ha he has no more rope. It's, it's put up or shut up. Obviously when it comes to fifth year options, John Elway and almost every GM out there. I think it was Bob Morris had a, a nice article on this a couple of weeks back, not long after the news broke that the Broncos chose not to pick up his option. Um, bottom line is GMs don't, if, if, a, if a player does not garner the fifth year option as a former first round pick, it's almost virtually guaranteed that player isn't in, isn't in that same city the next year. There's always exceptions to every rule, Zach, but if Bowles goes out and just balls out this year and really plays well, cuts down the penalties, keeps lot clean, he'll get a second contract, I think, from the Broncos. But that's a massive, gigantic, huge if. You know, I was nodding my head at breakneck speed because I'm really agreeing with what you're saying there. He has no more margin for error left. He, he's, I believe he's 27 years old going into his fourth season now. That is old. There's no more room to grow for Garrett Bowles. He can grow into being a capable or competent tackle. He's not going to suddenly morph into an all-pro perennial pro bowler. I think that ship has sailed a couple years ago now. The best the Broncos can hope for is him being consistent, cut down on the holding penalties, the boneheaded penalties, stop taking points off the board. They can get consistency out of Garrett Bowles. Like you said, he'll score a second contract. Won't be a Juwan James type deal, but maybe a two, three year deal, incentives, this and that. I could see that happening, but he has to prove that, Chad. He and he has everything working against him right now. So if he's not motivated by Elijah Wilkinson competing with them, having his fifth year option pulled, all the crap he's hearing from the fan base, even John Elway, then nothing will motivate him ever again, Chad. Did you say 24? Because I just Googled 
Yeah, Google that. He's 28, dude. Yeah, I said 27, I figured, yeah. Oh, did you? So yeah. 27. He just turned 28 yesterday. He was oh. 27, obviously. So you were right. Yesterday, you would have been 100% right. Now you're <laughs> only one day off. But 28-year-old fourth-year player, he's already knocking on the wrong side of 30. Nice. Like he's he's approaching the front door, about to knock on the the wrong side. So he's got to he's got to turn the ship around. And this brings up a very wow. symbolic super chat, very generous George. super chat from one of our Mount Rushmore superstars. Appreciate you, George. Wow. Number from seventy-two. Very tough. He's he is holding out hope. He's he's holding out hope for for Garrett Bowles. Happy belated birthday to Bowles. With a much more mobile quarterback at the helm, he will be much better in 2020. And Zach, for the sake of optimism, George, you're the man. For the sake of optimism, Drew Locke, he did one of the one of the ways that he improved last year. Well, what's that's the wrong way to say it. One of the one of the elements that allowed him to improve down the stretch, which is one of the reasons why PFF continues to kind of be on his jock, was the emergence of, or I should say. Drew Locke getting inserted into that starting lineup. He was only sacked once because of Garrett Bowles. One time. Drew Locke proved to be in those five games, one of the hardest quarterbacks in the NFL to sack. So there is reason to believe that with Drew Locke back there, Bowles could take a step forward, but he's got to find ways to continue to kill, you know, not, not kill drives and whatnot with the penalties. You know, Drew Locke, his insertion made everyone around him better, Chad. From Garrett Bowles to Devontae Booker to Tim Patrick and Deshaun Hamilton. But that was a flash on the pan for the most part. It was a five-game sample where Locke and the Broncos offense kind of caught their opponents off guard kind of by storm. What's going to happen this season in 2020, the first time defenses adjust, the first time a defense schemes around Drew Locke, the first time they face adversity, can Bowles hold up through that? Will that trope be gone then? It, just because he did well for a five-game stretch doesn't make Bowles impervious to criticism. It doesn't erase three other years of incompetency. So he has to prove that week by week, snap by snap, that he can be the left tackle of the Broncos half of what the Broncos thought they were getting in the first round. Well said. Bona Beast reminding everybody, we're only six more subs away from 7,000 on oh, YouTube. So close. And so, again, we know that about 35% of our daily listening audience on YouTube doesn't subscribe, but they listen to each and every podcast. So if you're one of those guys, check and see, are you subscribed? If not, sub, help us get over the hump because we've got a really cool show planned for that to celebrate because seven is, a, of course, special and significant number for Broncos country. Zeus. Speaking of Mount Rushmore, Zeus McPeak. Here he is in the house showing the love like he always does. You know, we Thank appreciate you, you, my friend. Really do. It means a lot to us, my friend. You allow us. Your support is, has allowed Zach and I to really continue to pump time into these podcasts and making them better and putting up clips and finding new ways to give you guys content on YouTube. So it, it goes a long way, bro. That's why he's Zeus, Chad. Indeed. There's only one Zeus. Let's grab Derek here jumping in as well. Appreciate Thank you, Derek. Derek. He says, thanks for the content. I can watch and hear about Broncos football all day and night. Just wanted to show support. Hashtag Denver Broncos for life. Appreciate that, Derek. And it is true that like, if you look at MHH's YouTube channel from even a year ago, we would have at least one post from a podcast every day that would be shared from our Spreaker feed onto YouTube automatically. And then, you know, probably two or three videos throughout the week. No live streams. I'm talking about May of 2019. We weren't doing any live streams. Now you've got a live stream every single day breaking down the latest Broncos news and analysis, deep diving on, you know, depending on which show it is. Then you've got three, four videos a day coming out at MHH. So we've really tried to step our game up on the YouTube side, the video side, the streaming side, the podcast side. And it's due to the outpouring of support that we have received. So you guys are directly responsible for the onslaught of MHH Broncos content. And I can personally say it's so fun I mean, for a living, Chad. We talk about and write about a game. We talk about football, which we talk about either way. It's a major hobby in both our lives. I mean, both of us have pretty much revolved our lives around football. But we get a check for talking about football. We love to do it. I, it's not even work for me like you were talking about, Chad. When you don't think of it as work, it's just fun. You like doing it. You look forward to doing it. And that's when it comes to Broncos football, I, I cannot get enough talking about it or writing about it. Wow. That's actually when I saw this, and I, I concur 100%, my brother. When I saw this from Kenneth, he says, Glenn Milburn has the record, 404 all-purpose yards in a single individual game. Do you think that record will ever be broken? 
I looked at that and at first I was like, that seems kind of small. I know that's a big number, don't get me wrong, but all time. And I just Googled it and sure enough, 404. The next biggest game was from Billy Cannon, 373. And then AP, Adrian Peterson had a 361 yard rushing game. Wow. And Michael Lewis was up there too uh, at number four. So to your question, Kenneth, will it be broken? Maybe someday, but that's probably a record that's going to continue to stand for a while. Yeah, that's that's a lot of yards in one game. Even AD running for what what was it three sixty? What'd you say? Three three sixty one. I want to say that's a lot. Three sixty one. Uh, it's like three games worth of yards in one game. He was incredible in his prime, Chad. Worst player from Pickle Nick on our roster is Isaac Yadam. But as far as I under as far as underrated, I believe that's Tim Patrick. So Patrick is a guy that is a little bit underrated in terms of you know, I don't know. I don't know if I can agree with that, Pickle Nick, to be honest with you. I just don't think he's established enough yet to really deserve a rating. He hasn't made himself a bona fide starter, first and foremost. He's a fringe guy now. I mean, the Broncos spoke loud and clear last year. They obviously had some high regard for Tim Patrick because they made him one of the two slots from IR that they activated alongside Drew Locke, right? Well, he was even activated before Drew Locke. They obviously needed him. They obviously had a high regard for Tim Patrick. But the way the offense finished, even with Drew Locke in there, the Broncos felt like they needed to go upgrade. So Tim Patrick, because he's not a, a incumbent starter or a shoe-in starter and he doesn't have a few more years, I'm not sure I would agree with that. But I do understand the point you're trying to make, Nick. And then the Broncos go out and draft three wide receivers, including a slot guy, which kind of <laughs> is an indictment on Tim Patrick and Deshaun Hamilton. But I would even venture to say that Cortland Sutton is more underrated. Second team Pro Bowler, Chad? I mean, that's... That's true. Ridiculous. True. But I think he's just going to get bigger and better. Oh, um, yeah. What's that new phrase that's coming going out on in Broncos country memes? Judge Judy, right? For Jerry Judy and Supreme Court yeah. for Supreme Court. Yep. And, and I think that's going to continue to be his trajectory. He's going to get better and better. Joe Turner jumping in with a very generous super. Wow. Appreciate Thank that, you, Joe. Joe. He says, best of the best. Thanks for the entertainment, guys. Keep up the good work. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Really you. means a lot. We thank you, my friend. Um, Mike Evans as well, one of our superstars, really consistent each and every podcast, showing the love, keeping the, the lights on at MHH YouTube. Appreciate that, Mike. Thank you, Mike. He says, we uh, need your opinion. Do you think the presence of Chris Harris suppressed Justin Simmons' ability to be a vocal leader on defense? Mike, I think that might have been the case his first couple of years. In fact, Justin Simmons at one point talked about how he and Will Parks were baby no fly, right? Because this Correct. was back still when you had T.J. Ward, Darian Stewart, Akeem Tlaib, uh, and Chris, and Roby. And so that first year, um, that whole entire 2016 Simmons rookie year, you had the entire no fly zone still on the roster. Then T.J. Ward was the first to go. And I think by the time you get to his fourth season last year where he really broke out, I'd be hard pressed to believe he was holding back much because of Chris Harris, but I could be wrong. Leaders are going to lead regardless of who's around or what's going on. So I don't believe that Chris Harris is, and I wasn't a big fan of Chris Harris Jr. toward the end, but I don't believe his presence hampered Justin Simmons' ability to lead. He's not so outspoken, Justin Simmons. He's not the biggest raw, raw mouthpiece like Derek Wolf, but he is a quiet leader who leads by example with his play. And I believe he'll shine more now, especially with Harris out of the picture. But just him having the opportunity to be a staple of that secondary now, that's going to help him grow and be a better leader. Amen to that. Let's grab Eddie here. Jumping in. $7 super. Thank really you, appreciate Eddie. that, Eddie. You've been very consistent on the streams lately, and we appreciate you, bro. He says, I'm glad to be watching live with my MHH fam. Almost at 7K, and y'all deserve it. Hashtag Denver Broncos for life. Hashtag praising the priest. That's awesome. That's, Thank a, you. that's a new hashtag. Appreciate that, though, yeah. Eddie, my friend. And uh, it's, it's all thanks to you guys. You guys are keeping it going, and we love you for it. All right, let's see here from Timothy on YouTube. Keep a balance between supers and non-supers as best we can. How are the signing of draft picks going? Hashtag state of being in the Viking ship hole. That's with a P of Minnesota. <laughs> a lot going on in Minnesota right yeah. now. We don't need to talk about that necessarily on this podcast. So, um, But, yeah, how are the draft picks? No one's been signed yet, to my knowledge. But that will happen probably as soon as – I would say right as you get 
right as you're approaching training camp is typically when those those Elway likes to get those deals done. And Judy, there could be, who knows, Zach, there might be a little bit of a bone to pick, but these slotted contracts for first round picks, I mean, right. even Drew Locke last year, he kind of had a little bit of a bone to pick because he wanted a little bit of that quarterback premium as a second round pick, but Elway stonewalled him and he showed up. That was coming from Locke's agent, of course, just trying to maximize and do what he should representing his client. I think Jerry Judy will get his, his you know, significant signing bonus as the number 15 overall pick and everyone else will fall in a row like dominoes. Yeah. You know, we made a good point, which is true in this day and age, we don't really worry about holdouts or anything like that with the structured pay scale. The only thing is for third round picks, there's usually a lag between signing them because they hold out for offset money or other guarantees in their contract. I don't know the, the, the literal, uh, language behind it for third round picks. I just know traditionally that's how it's been, but I anticipate no problems going forward, Chad, for the rookie class. Nah, it'll be cool. <clears throat> Very nice pun. Thank you, James. Bobby <laughs> jumping in, showing some love. Wow. We really appreciate Thank that, you. my friend. Thank you so much. You Superstar. are also, you've been super consistent and very generous to the channel since you made yourself known to us. And we really appreciate you, Bobby. Thank you, my friend. Um, Here's from Clay on Facebook. We don't want to neglect our Facebook audience, which is approaching 90,000 uh, followers. So, Clay, thanks for joining the stream, my friend. He says, if we leave out Philip Lindsay enough, do you think we put him on the trading block? Do you see any way that that could happen and John Elway could survive the villagers and the pitchforks? Elway could could literally shoot someone in Denver and survive that chat. He has so much leeway and so much rope. Uh, but you know what? You asked me three months ago. I would say that trading Philip Lindsay is never going to happen, but signing Melvin Gordon and giving him the money they did, I don't know. If, if Lindsay's kind of phased out this year, which I don't think he will be, and Melvin Gordon really takes hold of that workhorse job, you never know with Elway. He's impulsive, he's rash, and he doesn't really seem to love Lindsay like we do. By the way, guys, <clears throat> if you hear me sniffling and uh, clearing my throat, my allergies are killing me right now, so just bear with me. Terry jumping in up in Canada, proving, as always, Broncos country is not a geographic location. It is a state of being. That's right. Thank you, Terry. And he's just showing some love, and we love you back, Terry. We love you. T-Dog, that's what we'll call you, dude, T-Dog, from uh, The Drill Great Bit White Taylor. North. Do you remember Drill Bit Taylor? It's a good movie. The kid's name, the chubby kid, his name is Ryan, but he can't, he doesn't like, he wants to be a rapper. Our dog just doesn't quite roll off the tongue the way T Dog does. So that's what he goes with. Anyway, um, here's Tony on YouTube. He says, if Bowles has a Pro Bowl season and earns an extension, how much and for how long? Love from Spokane, Washington. Hashtag state of being very cool. Tony, appreciate you. Um, if he balls out, he'll get a, I don't know. If he depends on how hard he balls out, like if he just plays at a medium competent level, like if he plays the way he played down the stretch last year and it's a penalty, you know, every other game type thing or even two penalties per quarter of the season or something, if he keeps it 10 penalties and under for the entire season and plays like he did down the stretch, I think you're going to see him get seriously paid. Now I'd have to pull up spot track and I guess we can do that. If you want to look at what the highest paid left tackle contracts are, but he would, he would be pushing for something like that. Elway might be able to get him to take a team discount, but I don't know. It's hard to say. Boils is a good nickname for bowls though, Chad, as, as it was laid out <laughs> in the comments because they're annoying and they, they're hard to get away. So, uh, you know, I don't see the Broncos breaking the bank. If Garrett Bowles has a, a solid season, which is Garrett Bowles standard, I would see a two or three year deal. I don't think even if he writes the ship, he's going to be the long-term left tackle. I think the Broncos realize he's just not consistent enough. And even with the addition of Mike Munchak and a better quarterback, he just does not have it. We can hope that he survives 2020 being competent. He doesn't get Drew Locke killed. And for his own personal worth, he scores a two or three year deal. For what it's worth really quick, <clears throat> the highest paid tackles in the league are around between 12 million per year, upwards of 16 million per year. No um, way. I'm not doing it. How comfortable would you be given a, even after one solid season or even better, even if it was a Pro Bowl season? Let's pretend it is just for a minute. Garrett Bowles goes out there in 2020, produces Pro Bowl caliber. How comfortable are you going to be to pay him top of the line money? I'm not going to be. And that's why I think they'd maybe consider franchise tagging him and seeing if it is, mm. it was a fluke. Um, but they'd be in a, be in a rock and a hard place, man. They'd be stuck. 
if he makes a Pro Bowl, he's going to have a lot of leverage on his side chat. He's going to probably score a, a massive payday, but the Broncos should protect themselves with incentives or outs in his contract. Not a lot of guaranteed money. If he has a Pro Bowl season, he's going to get paid. I just hope the Broncos in that it's scenario don't break. $16 million per year, Pro Bowl or not, I am not giving to Garrett Bowles. I'm just not doing it. Let's grab Junior here, <clears throat> who is jumping in with a $10 super. Really appreciate that, Junior. <laughs> Thank you, Junior. If Funny. you're on uh, Twitter, make sure you reach out to us. This goes for all our Super Chat superstars. We want all of our listeners to reach out on Twitter. Don't get us wrong. But on, we also like to show love on Twitter to the superstars after each podcast by shouting you out and tagging you. So if you are on Twitter, reach out. Let us know who you are, and we can connect in that way. And he says, Zach, hold a party. He holds <laughs> enough, LOL. Very appropriate, my friend. Good it's play fun. on words. It is what it is. Um all right, Clay, we got your question. I see you kind of have a similar one there on Lindsay, but we got to keep it moving here. King Hicks is still having problems with his super. Um, might need to log in and out of YouTube. Don't necessarily need to do it now, but King, you might want to try either logging in or out on on uh, YouTube. Check your Google wallet. There might be some kind of problem there. That's the only thing I could figure, bro. Uh, but it's all good. You're in the You're in the stream. You're participating in the chat. That's what matters most, my friend. Ben Roth jumping in with a $5 super. Thank Thanks, you, ben. ben. That's two days in a row. We appreciate you, my dog. He says, I read a couple articles saying McTelvin Ajim was most effective as a nose tackle in college. Jarrell Casey, Ajim, Shelby Harris on the D-line has some potential. He's a little too small to play. I mean, you saw how that went down, Ben, last year when they put Shelby Harris at nose tackle the first quarter of the season. It was an SHI T-shirt show. It was bad. And it felt the, the opponents were just running the ball down the Broncos' throat because Harris wasn't big enough, stout enough to hold the point. And Ajim would not be right now at this stage. He's barely over 300 pounds. But in college, on pass rush situations, yeah, they would move him around that D-line and let him rush because he's, a, he's, a, he's much too quick for guards and interior guys to contain consistently. And so that can have some value for the Broncos in terms of a NASCAR package, Zach, but don't be – expecting McTelvin and Jean to project as a nose tackle. For now, that's Mike Purcell. Uh, that could be uh, Joel Heath, potentially, we'll see. But I don't think – Ajim's going to be a backup five-tech defensive end this year. He's going to come in and, you know, have to compete with Draymond. He's going to have to compete with Demarcus Walker. We'll see how well Christian Covington sticks. I expect him to stick. But those are the guys he mainly has to compete with and spell Shelby and, and Casey. That's what I was going to say. You have Draymond Jones, you have Demarcus Walker, Covington. There's so much depth right now at that position, which is good for the Broncos, but not necessarily great for Ajim. That's a guy who was drafted for 2021 and beyond. He might have been a Shelby Harris replacement, maybe down the road a Drell Casey replacement. He was drafted for the future. He's going to make an impact now. He'll get rotational snaps, but he's not going to start. He's not going to be the sack master. He's going to take some time to acclimate to Fangio's system. Really appreciate that, Ryan. He says, Chad and Zach spoil us. Never seen people more committed. Chad, a.k.a. the man with the plan. I have no time, and he helps me when I need it. Rock on, bro. Hey, all good, buddy. We appreciate you. Thank you, Ryan. Here's a nice joke for you from Mitch Man. We should rename Bowles Hodor since he is so good at holding. <laughs> and what did we learn? I don't want to spoil Game of Thrones for those of you who might still be watching, but we learned that his name became that. Uh, because that was the only thing he would say because it was the last thing that he heard hold the door basically. And that's how he would say it. Cause he was, you know, he had problems or whatever. So yes, that makes a lot of sense. And Zach, it's not the first time I've heard someone can uh, refer to bulls as Hodor. It just makes me feel great. We're talking about our first round left tackle drew locks, blindside protector in these ways, Chad, it just makes me realize <laughs> what we've suffered through with Garrett bulls the last three years. Aiden wants to know, how do you guys feel about CBS Sports Broncos record prediction? I haven't seen it. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. I don't even know what it is. Tell us what it is, Aiden. Circle back in this chat stream, uh, and we will happily tell you how we feel about it. Steve jumping in with a question. Did you guys see the photos of Drew Locke throwing to the receivers and Lindsey running? Yes, did see that. It's cool to see. Locke is definitely doing what he can now that he's back in the Mile High City to – start forging some chemistry with his guys and get out there and throw the rock. I don't think any of the rookies quite yet, though, have made it to Denver. So that hasn't been able to happen yet as far as Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler. Albert O, won't take long for he and Locke to get back on the same page. Um, all right, let's see. 
Oops, do that, do that again, Buana. Sorry, I it, we we hit it the exact same time. Jeff, yo, still have family visiting, but just wanted to pop in and say hi. Hope all in Broncos country are healthy. Amen. Well, Thank you. Thanks for doing so, Jeff. And it's good to see you, my friend. Kathleen, how many people are allowed to keep their job with a substandard performance for three years in a row? Most people only get three months to prove themselves in a job. Sometimes people will get six months. That's very sure. true, Kathleen. Pro sports is unique in that sense, though, yeah. because it's not just player virtue. It's not just player performance, but you also have pedigree. You also have the pride of a front office or a head coach who pounded the table for that guy. And they hold out against hope that I was right. I was right. I saw something in them. And, you know, sometimes they're proven right. Most of the times that stubbornness, you know, if it, if it quacks like a duck, you know, the whole saying there, it ends up being a duck. And in the case of Garrett Bowles, that's what it has appeared to be in these first three years. At. You know, nepotism also plays a part of it in the NFL yes. chat. People like Brian Schottenheimer, who have no business being a coach or a coordinator, who's failed repeatedly, they get second chances. Pro sports athletes are just held to a different standard than we are in day-to-day -day jobs. They get a lot more money than we get. They get a lot more opportunity. They get a lot more exposure. They're just given a, a bigger and better platform than we get. So I agree with the premise in that, Chad. He, he's had way too long to prove himself, but athletes are just held to a different standard. It's just what's so. This is the kind of dedication we see from our awesome audience and community from Darian. If we're that close to 7K, I might just make six more YouTube accounts and subscribe. <laughs> Bunch of burners. You don't need to do that, but we appreciate this. <laughs> Thank you, friend. Darian. I know you're just joking around anyway, but nevertheless, Brian here. Chad and Zach, very awesome, amazing, incredibly the greatest MHH ever. We appreciate that, Brian. Very kind of you, my friend. Thank you. All right. Let's see what else we got here from the peeps. Gustavo. Jumping in with a $2 super chat. Thank Appreciate you. that, my friend. And if you're on Twitter, make sure you reach out. We will connect. I really hope that we sign a tackle and a new cornerback is what Gustavo's hoping for. I think with regard to both situations, the Broncos are in a holding pattern at least and until a couple weeks get into camp. They're going to see how things take shape. Again, when we've already talked enough about tackle, I think, in recent weeks, but as it relates to the cornerback situation, Zach, they are relying on some of these young guys to step up and prove their worth. I'm talking about the Isaac Adams. I'm talking about, you know, the third round pick this year, Michael Ojemudia. But I think more so Fangio was talking about, yeah, Adam, Devontae Harris, Duke Dawson, even Bryce Callahan, but probably not so much Bryce Callahan. They're, they're hoping those three guys, even Shaquille Taylor, who is a futures guy that they've signed, they're hoping two of these guys. Fangio has his eye on two in particular that he thinks are going to show big time improvements in 2020 we'll see bosby and uh essaying bassy two, right. two bosby, other young yeah. young cornerbacks i mean the broncos say what you want about them they're fairly unproven in that back end but they have a lot of youth and depth you can't say the same thing about tackle so i'm of the opinion still you can't rely on elijah wilkinson behind Bowles and juan james but like chad said it seems like they're waiting and waiting and waiting to see what happens but the panthers chad they they signed eli apple today so there there's still moves to be made on the open market and I wouldn't mind Eli Apple. I wouldn't mind the veteran cornerback, but I feel better about the cornerback core than I do the offensive tackle depth chart. Agreed. Cottonmouth seven, <clears throat> excuse me, Cottonmouth seventy eight jumping in ten dollars super. Thank you. Appreciate Cotton that, Mouth. my friend. And if you're on Twitter, reach out, my friend. Good evening, guys. Are the Broncos getting any practices in yet? Tom Brady had a couple weeks now with his guys. Has had a couple weeks now with his guys. Uh, FYTB, by the way, is what, what he actually put in. We all know what this means. Appreciate that, my friend. Just um, friendly get-together throwing session since Drew Locke has been back in Denver for now about 10 days, approaching the two-week point this weekend, I believe. And so no players and coaches, in case you missed it, have been allowed yet to return to facilities across the NFL. That is expected to change as soon as the first week of June. It could happen. Now, there's no reports necessarily I, that I'm aware of yet guaranteeing that or saying that this is what's going to happen. But basically, they've been waiting for a few other dominoes in states to, to fall, including New Jersey. They were waiting for California. They were waiting for New York, even though, as you mentioned, Zach, neither the Giants nor the Jets practice in New York. The Buffalo Bills do. So all these different states, you know, if one state, Colorado, for example, is allowing certain businesses to open up and as long as certain safety guidelines are in place, employees can come back in the building. 
Well, other states aren't. And so the NFL wants to maintain competitive balance. So until all players and coaches can return, none can return to facilities. So that means OTAs, minicamp, all on hold. And it might end up being just, you know, the Zoom meetings that they're doing. And then they just tackle the on-field aspect in training camp at the end of July, Zach. Yeah, in fact, Goodell today actually extended the off-season program, the virtual off-season program, by two weeks. So I'd be shocked if we had any team facilitated practices between now and training camp. Like you said, Chad, uh, in states where it's allowed, you can have throwing sessions, you can do socially distanced workouts if that's uh, what what the case may be, but there's not going to be any team-oriented practices, I feel like, until training camp in late July. It could be exactly that, guys. But there is still a lot of time between now. It's basically exactly two months till training camp yeah. opens. So a lot can change and progress and improve between now and then. Let's hope. Let's cross our fingers. J-J-J-J-Bone jumping in with a $10 super. Appreciate you, Thank my you, friend, Justin. as always. You know that. It says, not a football question, but which of you two could run up <laughs> 20 flights of stairs faster holding a mailbag befitting St. Nick himself? <laughs> I got you. Both hashtag just kidding. Totally could not shout out to King Hicks. Yeah, uh, definitely not me, dude. I don't know, Zach. I know your uh, conditioning might be down a little since the word that she'll be on unmen- uh, uh, she'll continue to go unmentioned. But yeah, no, I couldn't do that. I mean, I hate the treadmill, so I wouldn't want to run up flights of stairs holding a mailbag in my hand. I- I'm gonna just hit the bench <laughs> press. I'm gonna do some bicep curls. I- I'll leave the cardio stuff to somebody else. All right, let's see what else we got here. We're sitting at 41 minutes. We're sitting pretty right now. All right, let's see what else we got here. From James Campbell, big-time member of the community, he says, Judge Judy will bring the Hamler down <laughs> when the court is in session. So many puns. Yeah. It's awesome, dude. I love it. I love it. Very funny. Uh, let me see if I can get this. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. Awesome. Um, mine's about to do a jump. Did I click on that? What do you think from uh, Sky Ace 81 on YouTube? What do you think about Rivers, Philip Rivers, going to the Colts with their offensive line? Media thinks they should make it to the AFC title game. What do you think, Zach? You know what? I, I think they're going to be a pretty dangerous team in the way they drafted. They got Michael Pittman. They have T.Y. Hilton out there. They have Marlon Mack. They have Quentin Nelson. They have a great offensive line. And Rivers, I think, has a couple years left in the tank. They're going to win, I believe. This is a bold take right now, the AFC South. They're going to make some noise in January. I'm a, I'm a big Phillip Rivers fan. You can crucify me for that if you want. He's in a better position now than he was with Los Angeles. I think they're going to have a good season. Great coaching staff, good competent quarterback, good offense. I, I think they're going to make some uh, progress this season. <clears throat> I tell you what, I hated Phillip Rivers during the Jay Cutler era, and I love the trash talk those two had during the game. I don't know. I know it's not befitting. It's kind of like when – politicians, you know, hurl epithets. You think that it's kind of tarnishes the office and the same thing for quarterbacks talking smack on the, on the field. Some people feel anyway, not me. I love seeing Jay Cutler chirping Philip rivers, as we know, is one of the biggest mouth dudes in the NFL. Yeah. And I love the one thing I like about Philip rivers. First and foremost, he is an extreme competitor yes. and he manages to talk world-class smack without ever cursing. Not one. He just doesn't curse. So you got to get, trust me, when you're out there and, you know, you've got the adrenaline pumping and you're pissed off and emotions are, are rising and whatnot. It's really hard if you're going to talk to not curse. And yet he finds a way to do it. So kudos to him. He's also an elite procreator. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is true. Cannot. I don't think anyone in the league outside of Antonio Cromartie, one of his former teammates, <laughs> That's can, good point. can beat him on that front. Um Great friend of the show and super chat superstar, Mr. Boggins, jumping in. Really appreciate the super Thank bro. You. He says, red zone targets, Sutton, Judy, Fant, Alberto, Patrick, hashtag odds. Yeah, that's some uh, serious, serious red zone ability for Drew Luck. And it's, I mean, it's just going to be really cool. Eric Trickle had that video and article on, you know, just how creative can Pat Shermer get. And how creative he gets is going to probably determine quite a lot about how this season goes for the offense. But man, we've already seen what kind of a beast Sutton is in the red zone. I'd like to see Fant utilized more as a red zone threat. He really wasn't utilized all that much. The Houston game, he you know he was able to catch a red zone touchdown, but all his two other scores of that season came from him breaking you know short receptions into long gains and a touchdown, including the Browns game and 
what was the other one? I want to say maybe the t- the Titans game, but I could be misremembering that. But nevertheless, Mr. Boggins, your point is not lost on those. Yeah, Sutton is Sutton. He's going to get his. And I think that the second biggest beneficiary will be, will be Noah Fant. Everyone's going to be involved, but I think Fant and Sutton will cash out the most in the red zone. But don't discount, as much as I really don't like the addition too much, is Melvin Gordon. He's going to be the workhorse. He's going to get the early down carries. And they, they signed him for his receiving ability. So in the red zone, he can come in handy as well. Robert jumping in on YouTube to ask, do you think the wide receiver four will ball out considering the first three, Judy Sutton and Hamler, will have all eyes on them with Fant? No, I think more often than not, you're going to see that fourth receiver be a running back out of the backfield. So you're going to see Judy Sutton, Hamler, or Judy Sutton, Hamilton, catching a lot of passes along with Fant. But also, as, as Zach just said, I mean, Gordon and Lindsay are going to get a lot of carries. They're going to try and take some pressure off lock by pounding the ball with that interior offensive line they've got now. And out of the backfield, you're going to see Gordon especially utilized as a receiver. I, well, define ball out. I mean, if it's 500 yards, 1,000 yards, the number four wide receiver in any offense isn't going to put up a 1,000-yard season. This isn't Madden. I mean, the Broncos are loaded on paper, but there's only – so many reps to go around. There's so many mouths to feed, not a lot of scraps to go around the Broncos offense. So it's going to be Sutton. It's going to be uh, Noah Fant, Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler. And then after that, it's going to kind of wane off to the second tier with the Patricks and the Hamiltons. Yep. Keep, keep the expectations in check. Everybody King Hicks says, because I love this community, keep it going and growing. Hashtag MHH family Broncos world, smash the like button and subscribe road to seven K. I do it for the culture. <laughs> it gets me pumped up. Yeah, dude, I'm ready to run through a wall, my friend. <laughs> Let's go eat right, a well, snack. Indeed. All right, let me see what we got here. A lot of people reminding everybody, hit the like button. We love seeing it. Everyone taking ownership and contributing. We really do appreciate it, that. Hit that like button. Brian wants to know, with the drafting of Albert O, does anyone have buyer's remorse <clears throat> on the signing of Nick Bennett to a two-year deal? Would rather have a cheaper Andrew Beck. I've had it. I've had buyer's remorse on Nick Vanette since the day it was made, <laughs> since the picture the Same. deal was signed. Honestly, like, and it's again, it's similar to the Gordon deal in that it's not so much a knock on the player, but just in that particular case, it's a different dynamic than the one with Gordon. In that case, you're paying a guy to come in to a position in which it's a log jam. Maybe, maybe you can't quite call it uh, an embarrassment of riches because. So many of them are unproven guys who have kind of failed to maybe meet expectations. But can you really say that about Troy Fumagalli, who was injured his whole rookie year? Last year was the first time you really got to see him on the field. Everything I saw from Andrew Beck was encouraging last year. He just joined the team on the doorstep of the season as a waiver pickup. Jake Butt, we'll see. No one's counting on him to make an impact, but he's going to be there to compete. There are a lot of options. I mean, even Jeff Hireman. I think Nick Vanette, I'm not – let me put it this way. I'm not positive. Nick Van Ed is an actual upgrade over Jeff Hireman. And since that's the case, why you're already paying Hireman. Why are you paying Van Ed when it's all going to be about uh, Noah Fant for the most part? Right. Albert O as time goes on. I can't even compare this to Gordon. I mean, you're talking about the contracts, which I understand, but at least Melvin Gordon, the Broncos think they're upgrading the backfield by signing him over and playing him over Philip Lindsay. What does Vanette bring to the table that, like you said, a Fumagalli, a Hireman, uh, a Noah Fan, Andrew Beck, Austin Fort, what couldn't they do? Why give that guaranteed money out when you could just draft? There's a billion blocking tight ends every draft class. Just draft a guy. I hated that signing then, and I hate it now, Chad. I do not understand it. <clears throat> Excuse me. E. Dot. Tucker wants to know on YouTube, do you guys think the number 30 should be retired? My opinion, first and foremost, Lindsay got permission from Davis, Terrell Davis to rock 30, even though 30 is not retired, but because he was a running back and because he grew up a Broncos fan and had an appreciation and respect for the history of the number 30, thanks to Terrell Davis, he got permission in person from Davis to, to rock it. My personal opinion on the retiring of numbers, Zach, is it should be extremely selective. Right. Just because the guy's in the hall doesn't mean you retire his number. And it needs to be guys who ch- who changed the destiny of the franchise. 100%. Forever. Yeah. John Elway, his number deserves to be retired. Frank Tripuca, I don't really think his number deserves to be retired as someone who knows the history of the Denver Broncos. He had a role to play. He helped get the ball rolling. I don't think it should be retired. So to answer your question, EDOT, my answer is no. 
I'm fully with you, Chad. I can even argue, though, that between Tripuka and uh, Peyton Manning, you can probably retire 18. That's probably good enough. But uh, John Elway's number seven. That's the only one I think. Terrell Davis, you can't really retire it now if, if Lindsey's wearing the number. Maybe when he's he moves on or changes numbers. Not now. I don't. I don't. I don't think it's gonna be retired. One of our superstars, Glenn, jumping in five dollar super to say, Thank you, any Lord. truth to the rumors that Unfold is playing the Super Bowl halftime show? Their drummer is fire. Hashtag good tunes. You know the irony there, Glenn. My old punk rock band from my college years, Unfold. We. I was not the drummer. I was the lead singer. And wrote the songs in that band. That's that's what I did in Unfold. So you guys can check it out. You can find it. I think we shared a link at another time, but it was a good time. It was a great period in my life going to going to school and doing a little music and jumping in a tour van and running around. It was fun, but uh, definitely I don't want that lifestyle now. Sitting here at forty years old, being in a van. A lot of my I have a lot of friends and colleagues from that era whose bands continue to go and are going to this day. And they are basically, you got 365 days in a year, Zach. These dudes, to make a living, unless you're a multi, multi platinum selling artist or band, to make a living in today's world, you can't, it's not selling CDs, it's not selling records, it's not selling downloads. You have to tour constantly. So these dudes are on the road. These, these artists are on the road. You know, if you got 52 weeks in a year, they're on the road, a lot of them in the 40s in terms of the week. So that's not a life I envy at this point. I was going to say, Chad, you have to belt out a verse now. I mean, you can't tease <laughs> that and talk about your past life and not bring it to your current life. So maybe one I of these days. I can't think of one, dude. Honestly, off the top of my head right now, I, I couldn't think of A little of sample one. of anything. Generic. Just, uh, just, just if, you, if you guys are, <laughs> are curious, you just got you just got to Google it. I don't know. I, cu I couldn't come up with one. Uh, David Kilgore, one of our big time supers wow. from MHH Mount Rushmore. Awesome, consistent David. Every single podcast. We love you, bro. Thank you, David. He says, if Locke tanks, I would be pounding the table for drafting Lawrence, Trevor Lawrence. He's too good and is a once in a lifetime quarterback, but that's a big if, right, David? I mean, Locke would really have to tank. Do my question to you is, do you really think that's going to happen? I know no one can, no one has a crystal ball. We can't look into the future and know for sure. But based on what you've seen so far, do you really think that's going to happen? I get it. Trevor Lawrence is probably the best quarterback prospect coming out since Andrew Luck. And before that, Peyton Manning. Those three are talked about as like the most surefire guys, quarterbacks coming out of college. I'm not sure, my opinion, that Trevor Lawrence is quite on that level, to be honest with you, yes. as the Luck and the Mannings of the world. But nevertheless, similar to this year, I, I'm happy with Locke. Like, I'm I'm glad I would have taken Locke over the quarterbacks in this year's class. Absolutely. Even the first round pick. So I think I think for now you got to be, David, in a holding pattern. And Locke would really have to tank it in order for that to even become a conversation. I'm glad you said that. So I don't feel like I'm in the minority with my opinion on Lawrence. I, I don't see him being a generational talent. I see him having a, a very high bust potential in the NFL. He could be great. He could be a future Hall of Famer, but he can equally be the next Pax and Lynch as well. It, again, we'll say, if Locke fails this season, he is getting 2021 regardless. They would add a better experience back up behind him, but they're going to give Locke at least two, two full seasons as a full-time starter, as they should. James Campbell saying, Nick Vanette has a cuttable contract, so you let the competition play out at the wide tight end slot. Andrew Beck is more of an H-back than a wide tight end like Vanette, so different roles. Hireman could easily beat out Vanette. It's it's true. So, it could happen. Like they're not that big of a difference in terms of talent and wherewithal, Zach. But why even spend the money then if you're going to cut the guy later on? I mean, you have enough tight ends in the room. Why even bring one aboard right. and say, oh, your former third round bus can beat him out? That's, that's an indictment on you for signing Vanette in the first place. I mean, you can justify his addition all you want. I think the Broncos wasted money and added to a position of luxury for no reason. Brian bringing up Austin Fort, who was having he he had earned a place on the roster almost like he was yeah. rising as an undrafted rookie from what was it Wyoming I want to say right he was rising when he the weirdest ACL tear lower body Drew injury completes it was yeah completes a ball over the middle no collision he just he still made the catch though even though his knee so it'll be interesting to see how much of a factor Fort can be in year two you worry about how much that injury could set back his his, that momentum, you know, as uh, meager as it was for an undrafted guy, two, one year removed. Gary Palmer, showing some love on Super. We really appreciate that, brother. Thank you, Gary. That's two nights in a row, and we love you for it, my friend. He says, hey, guys, keep on keeping on. Love it. 
Amen, bro. We will. We will. And speaking of consistency, ah, Chris, Chris. Hernandez in the house, showing some love, very generous super Thank chat. You. We really appreciate you, bro. He says, click those little thumbs up, MHH fan. Listen to appreciate the man. that. Smash that like button. Amen. All right, let's see what else we've got here, guys. We're sitting at 55 minutes. We got a few, I got time for a few more here. Um, Dave, Cali Dave, appreciate you jumping Thank in, you, one Dave. of our superstars. He says, I need a live football fix. Claritin, Chad. Yes, yes. I actually don't like Claritin because even though when Claritin first came out, it was it was it was uh, marketed as the allergy medication that doesn't make you drowsy or affect you that way. And I think for most people it doesn't, but for me it does, and I don't like that. So I actually resist taking allergy medications of any kind. And if I because of that, I hate that feeling. So if I do, I take a Zyrtec. No, they're not a sponsor of this podcast, so not the last <laughs> time I'm going to say the word. But I appreciate the suggestion, though, my friend. Let me see here. Ben wants to know, what do you uh, think it would take salary-wise to sign Gordon, uh, Cordy Glenn, excuse me, or Jason Peters? Well, Zach, have you heard what Peters is looking for? I want to say it was in the 12 million mark. I don't know about Glenn, but I think he's looking for 12 million a year, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think that's the uh, the typical starter, low-end starters range. He's looking for just, I, I believe, commiserate to his ability and a nine-time Pro Bowler at 38 years old. I don't blame him for wanting to secure the bag, but Cordy Glenn should come, I think, at eight, nine million, seven million, somewhere in that range. And to me, to have security and peace of mind behind Garrett Bowles and Juwan James, that's money worth spending. J-Bone, I'm not on the Trevor Lawrence hype. The dude is good, but I'll take what we've got over tanking another year. Preach. Well said. Well said, my friend. All right, let me see what else we got, guys. We got to wrap it up here shortly. Let's grab Miller 707 champ. He says, what do you think Jerry Judy's chances are of winning Offensive Rookie of the Year? Locke plus Sutton plus Fant plus Lindsey. I say this: his chances are really good. I think he has a good shot at it too, to be honest with you, like a better than average. I, don't, I know there's an over-under on it. Um, or not an over under. I know there's some juice on it in terms of the the odds makers out there in Vegas. Is you know he's a not only a first round pick, but he's going to a team in which he's perceived to be a shoe in starter and with a quarterback and an offense on the rise. So it wouldn't surprise me to see him come out. I, I know the over under on his receiving yards as a rookie right now is eight seventy two. I want to say off the top of my head, pretty sure that's correct. I took the over slightly over. If he does. He might end up breaking Eddie Royal's all-time record for a rookie receiving season, which happened in 2008. So we'll see, Zach. What's your answer for Miller? Well, when I wrote about C.D. Lamb, I, I noticed that Jerry Judy had the fifth best odds of any offensive rookie of winning O'Roy this year. And it's more than C.D. Lamb. It's more than Henry Ruggs. He is the best receiver possibility to win O'Roy. And it could happen, but I think it's only going to happen if it's the year of Drew Locke. If he throws for 4,500 yards and he disperses the ball to different receivers, then Jerry Judy should capitalize. But it's going to take 1,200, 1,300 yards, 10 touchdowns, somewhere in that range. And when you have so many weapons, including Cortland Sutton, is that really a possibility? Is it really plausible? Well said. Jordan rocking the MHH mask like a boss. Appreciate the question too, my friend. He says, so is this the year that Garrett Bowles finally turns it around? Zach, if you had to bet money on it right now, what would you say? What would you do? Uh, def I guess it would be defined and turn around. Is it be consistent? Is it be average? Is it be a pro bowler? Is it live up to being a first round draft pick? I think he can be consistent, Chad. He can be capable of Average to above average, he can cut down a lot of a lot of his penalties and boneheaded play. I just don't ever see Garrett Bowles in the Pro Bowl. That's just my opinion. Indeed, it's. Uh, I think he he has the athletic talent that NFL teams can go gaga over, but he just lacks it between the ears up to this point. So can't teach what do we it. Got from Kenneth here, guys. Last one, and then we're going to get out of here for tonight. He uh, says, adding Graham Glasgow, Lloyd Cushenberry, and already having Reisner, I think the Broncos have a chance to challenge Mike Anderson and, and Tatum Bell almost getting 2,000-yard rushers. Hmm. That would be rad. What was that, the 2005 season, if I'm not mistaken? Kenneth and Buana, you might be able to remember that as well. 
One of them got over a thousand, and I want to say it was Anderson and Tatum Bell that year came just shy, but it might have been the other way around. That was a dynamic two headed rushing attack behind Jake Plummer, helped lead the Broncos all the way to the AFC title game in which they were favored. They should have won that game, had the worst game of the Jake Plummer era. He just played terribly, unfortunately. And the, the Steelers upset the Broncos at mile high and went on to win the Super Bowl. Zach, if the Broncos take care of business in that game, Jay Cutler doesn't get drafted in the first round the next year. And they probably beat the Seattle Seahawks in that Super Bowl with, with yeah. uh, Alexander and Matt Hasselbeck. It's crazy how things work out that way. In terms of the question, though, I, I can see both players having a thousand scrimmage yards. I, I just don't th- see both having a thousand rushing yards. That would be just um, not what Shermer dictates in this offense—a very pass-happy offense with Drew Lock. They're going to run the ball a lot, but it, it would be a remarkable effort to see both go on over a thousand rushing yards, not just total yards. All right, guys, we appreciate you joining us tonight. Capping off another great week for the Huddle Up podcast. Buona Beast reminding everybody, hey, leave a like, subscribe, comment, head to milehighhuddle.com and huddleup.com for merch. Milehighhuddle.com is where you go to keep the conversation going Huddle and get all the other articles and deep dive content that we do and huddleuppod.com for merch. Thank you all for the support. Tomorrow night, Dove Valley Deep Divers, Lance Sanderson and Eric giant at uh, six, six o'clock mountain, 8 PM Eastern. And then don't forget Saturday night, the debut of the new MHH podcast with Luke Patterson and Nick Kendall. I'm not going to reveal what the name is. I'm going to let them debut that on Saturday and let them have fun with that. So make sure you stay tuned for that. It's going to be really good that I can promise you. Also make sure you're following the podcast on Twitter, everybody at huddle up pod. That's another great way to support what we're doing. The bigger we can get that account. We're pretty close to crossing it over 2,000 followers, I think, on Twitter, if I'm not mistaken. So get on over there, follow the, the Twitter account for the show, and then also at Mile High Huddle. You can find my partner here, Zach Kelberman, at Kelberman NFL, myself, at Chad and Jensen. And Zach, we'll, of course, talk between now and Sunday night, but have a great weekend, bro. You too, Chad. See you on Sunday. All right, gang. Thanks again for joining us. A Mile High salute to our Super Chat superstars. We love you. Born a beast. Appreciate everything you do for us, buddy. And uh, we will talk to you guys, the two of us, Sunday night. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We'll talk to you then.